of what happened in the sessions, but it's getting late, so basically we can make more spontaneous. The, the topics of discussion will be probably the ones that we are more interested in before we just start the final discussion. Um, I don't have much to add to this. Uh, you know uh, the people who are running the sub-sessions. Um, I can just start with any questions that was hanging from the previous sessions, plenaries or subgroups. It's really up to you. A question for you. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned post credit for me, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Interbank, yeah. interbank inter loans. Was you have mentioned that? Mm, I've, I'm not sure I mentioned it here, but it is true that in my book I talk about post credit. So I just wonder, yeah. how does that fit into your, your model of the real the So what I mean by post-credit money is, um, it's essentially, it's on, so credit money is, you issue a credit against, uh, and then, or you issue debt, which then circulate that money, but then the, the, the institution, which is typically a bank that issues this credit, is then obliged to pay back this debt in some form. And the way it was sort of normally work, or we tend to think it, is that the bank issues uh, a debt, and it's kind of, it would be obliged to pay this back in another kind of money, in physical money, in state money. If, But the way that this system has evolved is that that demand has become obsolete, more or less, so that which, which means that there are the limits to the amount of money that banks can issue is decoupled from the amount of central bank money in circulation. So it's, that's not to say that there aren't limits, but they are, the limits aren't um, the amount of central bank money in circulation. So that's what I mean by post-credit money. So credit money is not just something built on top of fiat money. It has sort of become its own system that is more or less independent from central bank money. And how do you fit that into the model of this kind of business? Because that's interesting. Yeah. To me, that's the bit that's missing from the conversation. Yeah. Okay. Well, the thing is, yeah, now maybe we get into philosophical technical. So, so Zizek's notion of the real is mm, sometimes it can be sort of materiality, but sometimes it can also be a lack, and it has sort of different meanings. But in any case, it's very elusive. Um, so, uh, how would how the post credit mm, how that fit into the model? Because in a way. Uh, I think I would say that it is state money no longer functions as the real of uh, this system. Uh, so, and then the question, of course, is is there then a real? And then I propose the houses. So that's what sort of generates this. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I can give a good answer to your probably come good to the question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've tried filling in these gaps and that doesn't always uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had a, uh, as I said already last night, uh, an extension to that frame. So you, you have the shambolic as, a, as an additional. <laughs> <laughs> you just want four to make it look like it's over all the time. Yes. <laughs> but it'd be opposite to the, to the uh, symbolic. The shambolic then be more of an excess. And in some sense, the, the post credit is almost uh, kind of an excess. You just, you just keep producing. And it's, mm. it's uh, while if the real is about lack, the shambolic is about excess and plenitude. And, and it's it's too much. You have too much of something. Um, and it seems to help in terms of fleshing out something that's missing, I think, from, from the triangle. 
Was there a question there? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, today, um, Sylvia and Dr. Lockelaw. One of the things in Ali's presentation that we didn't address, and I know we probably didn't have enough time, but is the relationship between the movements between the different spheres. Um, and it seems to me in the global financial crisis, we had imaginary money made state money. Um, and before that, we had imaginary run money making real money and making houses. Mm -hmm. And in a kind of Bitcoin universe, we may not be able to shape shift between those categories. Mm. So you're thinking that um, uh, these are good questions, but. Uh, So your question is how is is the in terms of these three circles is the Bitcoin is that a more static thing? Yeah, the on, like money at the moment is this unfixed, you know, um, thing that evolves socially. Yeah. Well, I think one way of answering this is that right now, if you look at the price of Bitcoin, it's or it it, it went up in two thousand thirteen and then it went down and then it went a little bit up again. And it's kind of stabilized now. But it seems, it seems that in order for the next sort of surge in Bitcoin to come around, uh, Bitcoin needs more merchants accepting it. So people are, are waiting for Amazon to adopt it or more. So, that's, so we're kind of waiting for some sort of dimension of the real, so to speak, something like real commodities, real... Uh, Production to sort of follow suit. Um, but, but the state isn't there. That's the sphere that we would be losing. It isn't. It isn't. But we could imagine. I mean, mm, yeah, we could imagine that. We could imagine that was the Max Kaiser proposal. We we could imagine states adopting, saying, "Okay, yes, we will accept Bitcoin as payment for taxes." And then that would get, but I mean the, the, the symbolic doesn't necessarily have to be the state. It could be law, just generally. And we know there's been a lot of discussions about law, and uh, and different uh, countries have handled Bitcoin differently. In Denmark, it's just considered an asset. In in Russia, I believe it's it's more or less banned. Or and so, um, and I think the, the future of Bitcoin is also going to be determined by whatever laws are put in place to uh, regulate it or facilitate it or whatever. Can I add to that? Yeah. Um, one of the things we, we, we are aware of in, in law at the moment is that the role of the state in some respects is diminishing. Um, whether you look at uh, national entities or, or supranational entities, there is a limit to what they can do. Now, if, if states produce law, for example, um, they actually can't produce sufficient law at the moment. They, they're, they're, they don't have the resources to do that. So what they've done is to devolve a lot of the lawmaking to private institutions. Amongst these, for example, are law firms, very large law firms, um, which put together uh, uh, a lot of contracts and transactions and joint ventures and things like this, which are, are you know, um, and to a large extent, the functioning of these contracts relies on the um, legitimacy and reputation of the particular firm that put it together. Um, and, and, and so, for, for example, when, when, when China was trying to industrialize, um, even though China has very good large law firms, they couldn't use them because nobody knew what their reputation was like. So they had to use American or English law firms to do, to do the deals. Um, and, and so we've moved into a, a kind of post-state world of private ordering, if you like, which is being done through, that's just one institution or lots of others as well. Um, so, you know, if you look at what was going on in the crisis, um, a lot of money that was being put out there wasn't money in any of the conventional sense. Um, a lot of it was in terms of very complex financial instruments, you know, collateralized debt obligations and things like this which were being put together inside investment banks, made up of many different constituent parts, uh, uh, mortgages, uh, foreign you know, exchange rates, 
uh, uh, swaps and things like this, all put together, all uh, uh, um, kind of segmented, and, and, but cemented together in such a way that they produced a, a kind of holistic item that could then be rated by the rating agencies and sold out into the market. Um, of course, nobody had a clue about what they were buying. Uh, uh, and, and nobody had any idea what the value of these things was, including the rating agencies as well. And so, of course, uh, um, and, and everybody forgot that the fact that some, you know, poor schmuck down at the bottom of the chain just bought a, uh, a house on a balloon mortgage where the, the interest rate tripled uh, after the first nine months and then stopped making interest payments and bang, you know, it sort of set off a chain all, all, all the way through. So, you know, I, I suppose what I'm, I'm, I'm getting at is that we now, in a world, and, and this is being recreated, uh, uh, the next big bubble is going to be in student loans. Uh, um, they're, they're, they're going to be the next one that's going to go pop in 20 years' time. Um, but uh, 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 we, we are still in this process now of, of creating more and more complex instruments that were going out into the world. And, and in, a, in a way, uh, um, these are, to some extent, transparent, like, a bit like I won't say they're blockchain, so they're certainly not, but I mean that you can see what's in them. It's just trying to predict their interaction of the elements is, is, is almost in, impossible in, in that way. But um, we, we live in this world now. I, I don't see any way out of that. I, I, I don't think you can regulate it very easily. Uh, um, I don't think you can control it very easily. And, and, and I think it will continue. Can I ask Nigel a question? Uh, he was talking about the Bristol Pound, the Bristol Pound and the mm. Brixton Pound. And, uh, but let systems have been around for, I remember back in the 80s reading a book about uh, the Wicklow, they had loads. Uh, so they've been, these systems have been around for a long time. Mm. So maybe these things just emerge continually but then fail for the same reason. So. Is there something different about the current system that is different from ones that have failed previously? Well, let's um, didn't necessarily fail, but I mean, the, the energy kind of got sucked out of the for a number of different reasons, um, in my understanding. One uh, reason was a kind of hoarding problem, uh, 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 you know, just not enough um, activity, which is classically a problem with these these things, anyone that's ever been involved in a small currency, like even like a babysitting token circle, would experience this. Another with LEPs actually, uh, and it does um, concern uh, lower currency movements, was, was uh, tax. Uh, um, LEPs activities uh, were deemed taxable uh, by the UK government, for example, and that pretty much killed one of the incentives of being involved. Uh, so there, there are lots of different reasons why, why things fail. Um, I'm sure, I mean, what, what I said it in the talk, what strikes me about um, all of the people I talked to involved in this, whether it's the Bristol Pound, the Brixton Pound, the, the Time, uh, or even uh, to some degree the crypto people, there's a certain kind of experimentalism in their outlook. So, so none of them believe that uh, they've got um, a, a product or a system that's going to last forever. The important thing to think about, though, is if for us here, we're money geeks, and so, like my fascination with Brixton Pound initially was, you know, can this form of money be made to work? And so for me, something like McDonald's getting involved is uh, like, you know, wow, that would be really interesting. But for them, of course, it would be you know, a disaster. The crucial point there is that, and someone from the Bricks and Pound said this to me, we're not, you know, she said that we're not actually worried about whether this thing works as money in the end. We have different aims. Our, our aims are to do with the local economy. And if a, if a local currency helps us achieve those aims, great. If it stops helping us to achieve those aims, then we'll move on, we'll try something else. Um, so there's a kind of flexibility in their thinking, I think, which is refreshing. Um, the other thing, um, to say though is that they're far smarter and better organized, I think, now. Um, and there's a kind of cross-party um, support, so you get a lot of different kinds of people involved in these things. Uh, Let's was quite a narrow um, community in, in, 
many ways. Um, and they're learning from the past and they're talking to each other. Today, a new book has just been issued by NEF called People Power New Money. I suggest you jump onto it because at the moment it's free. Uh, so go onto the NEF website and find it. I've just tweeted it. Uh, and that's based on um, a study uh, on local currencies in six different countries, European countries, including the UK, so it involves. It's uh, by an organization, Trans-European Organization for Community, Community Currencies in Action. And what NEF are trying to do is develop, a, 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 if you like, a template of how these things work and what the mistakes have been and where things have failed, what's worked, what hasn't worked, so that organizations that want to start these things have something to go on. So the knowledge base is there. So I, my sense is that they're just getting smarter, but I, you know, I don't think, you know, I, I wouldn't say the Brixton Pound on some criteria is a success. You know, it's not being used everywhere. It's, 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 it's divisive in some ways. Um, but on other criteria, it is a success because it's brought attention to Brixton. Uh, you know, people get excited around it. It's generating new ideas. I think the lottery is completely genius. I think that's a great idea. It could work really, really well. You know, so, so it depends what your criteria are. But, but I think, yeah, these things do come and go. The other thing to say is a lot of this sort of uh, alternative stroke complementary currencies are counter-cyclical. So the WIR system has lasted forever, it seems. But that generally only really shows um, itself in, in, a, in an economic depression when there's a shortage of mainstream cash and businesses start bartering. That's exactly what it is. Well, uh, with the, the beer was was mentioned because I was always curious to figure out. I mean, we have a long time. It was 31 century ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a yeah, very uh, long uh, time yeah. frame that we can look at local currencies. There is one question that perhaps starts with what was just discussed, but it was for everyone. It seems that there are a uh, lot of continuities between local currencies and cryptocurrencies, which I could see, especially as different from the state. But on the other side, I also see two, at least two major differences. One is uh, the network effect yeah. of uh, cryptocurrencies. I mean, I have uh, I see the Bristol pound as an experiment which I to Bristol. But once everyone in Bristol uses the Bristol pound, that's the end of the crop. You can trade more, but that's the population of reference. Uh, whereas for cryptocurrencies, you don't have that limit. What? You have 7 billion in Africa, or whatever kind of thing. So the network externalities there can play out much more strongly, uh, as we have seen in other kinds of uh, social uh, online services of all sorts. And Somewhat related to this is also the more evident challenge to uh, jurisdictions and states as uh, finite organizations. Because I, mean, I could see that the Bristol Pound could try to stay for a while outside the taxation system, but at some point the UK <coughs> you have to pay taxes. There's no way to enforce that kind of uh, decision on a decentralized open network, which is not really decentralized. But it spreads across jurisdictions, therefore you can play from a different jurisdiction against any decision in any, under any state. Like you can with real money. Yeah, no, I, I think... That's corporation, that's exactly what they do, that's why they don't pay tax. Yeah, no, and I think that, that these are discontinuities with the local uh, currencies, yeah. these are differences. Mm -hmm. that I think the, the key, I mean, I think you're right, the key difference between local currencies um, and uh, cryptos, look at their language, local currencies generally talk about complementary currencies, that's the language they use, and they don't like the word alternative currency because they're not trying to replace anything. This is very, very clear if you look at Spice. Spice does not seek to replace any any currency in, in, in existence. It seeks to add, which is why their logo, for example, says just add Spice. The whole point is they're just adding to what's already there, and they have a very firm commitment to the idea that there's a currency ecosystem, and they're just playing one small part in that. If you talk to cryptocurrency uh, advocates, some of them are comfortable with that idea, and they're comfortable with saying, you know, like for example, the most likely outcome for crypto is that it forms a small part of the, of the financial payment system. That's really what is likely to happen. That's the conclusion that Casey and Binger reach in their book, uh, The Age of Cryptocurrency, and I agree with them. You know, in the end, cryptocurrency will have a very important role to play on the margins. It won't take over the world. 
yet some Bitcoin and other crypto advocates seriously believe it will, and they're happy to use the, the language of alternative currencies. They seriously like this guy I was talking to, but you know, the libertarian who believes in monopolies. Um, you know, he seriously believes that there will be, in the end, one uh, form of currency in the world, and that will be crypto. I don't know if you saw last summer that the group of Bitcoiners produced that YouTube video of the Declaration of the Bitcoin Declaration of Independence. I don't know if you saw that. All about distributed sovereignty. It was, it was about, you, you must see it, it's really worth uh, watching, because this was the ideology, it still is in, in many cases. And there the idea was that yes, they, could, you know, they will take over the, the world's monetary system. Um, and they seriously believe that. So, you know, I, I, think, um, I think you're right, but the, for, for, for people that support local currencies and, and, and other country currencies, they, you know, they're, they're happy just to be to form part of a larger jigsaw puzzle of currencies. And that's, you know, I think, that, that, I think they're very realistic in that, so very pragmatic. But then following up, if there are no other questions right now, uh, then what I would find interesting from a social science perspective is what different kinds of uh, association right. we see behind both. Because if there are those differences, then I also suppose that the relations behind them, or the relations making those kinds of currencies, are different. Yeah. I mean, alas, there does seem to be a power law here, which we've not talked about. I, I, at the moment, all of these forms of money are incredibly centralizing. Um, you know, look at Bitcoin, all this stuff about the state. Bitcoin has a state. You know, the argument that somehow Bitcoin and the state, you now Bitcoin is its own world, and it has a state within it. It's called the Bitcoin Foundation, and that's in conflict with the developer. There is a politics within the Bitcoin community which resembles very much the politics you'll find in the mainstream monetary system. So you know, you, it's 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 important to understand that. I I, I think um, equally at um, local level, unfortunately, lots of local currencies do end up looking rather like parish councils uh, with a, with a group of of, of well-intentioned people full of enthusiasm at the centre. Uh, producing this fiat currency, making big decisions, uh, while everybody else sort of either tolerates it or participates or just ignores it. So there is a kind of, there, there's a worrying power law on the, and I have yet to see a genuine distributed currency and a genuine form of, of, of uh, uh, decentered uh, currency. I'm, I'm, I'm yet to see one. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe somebody can put me right on this. So that, that puzzles me because I get slightly worried then that, that inherently any form of money is going to have this sort of power at all. I don't know what people think about that, it's just an observation, but uh, it is slightly worrying. But that's certainly what's happened with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is incredibly centralized. Anybody that denies that is off their book. It's worrying. And it's also a, a shame. Yeah. We just discussed the conversation about uh, this. Um, yeah, it's it's clear that and, and it's transparent that it's very in in very few hands yeah. control. But what anybody can do but ownership and control, that's the thing that's sort of slightly different. We were discussing it. Yeah, I don't know how much I mean he was asking a really good Tim was asking a really good question. Who decides the twenty one million and how would that decision actually play out? And if you're invested in Bitcoin, if you've got like a million dollars worth of Bitcoin Clearly, if the decision was made overnight to double from 21 to 42, you're not going to be very pleased. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, your share suddenly being hammered. And I don't know the mechanics. I, I don't know if anybody here does know, that, you know, actually what, for example, the Bitcoin bosses who are up to their eyes in Bitcoin, and what say would they have in a decision? Do they have voting rights? Do you know? Does no, anybody know? Really is it like that any change to the core of the blockchain would have to be accepted by 51% of the community of miners. So it doesn't matter how much of miners, how, of how much miners, money you have. Miners. Yeah. Miners. Is that numbers of people or what? Mine. How do you measure that? Say again? The vehicle bosses don't mine. Most, no. most big Bitcoiners don't mine. They just trade. But couldn't you make this? Let's say that they so made a really decision to say, okay, let's double it to 42 million. Mm. Then you could have one branch saying, yes, we accept that, yeah. and that would go in one direction. 
And you would have another brand to say, no, we don't want that, right. and that would go in another I'm direction. I'm refiners, that's the crucial thing. So that, this is where a lot of the confusion with Bitcoin comes up. The concentration of wealth in Bitcoin is one issue. Mm. Uh, and you can get a, a huge amount of Bitcoin just by trading. I mean, I could go out now and I could just buy, if I was super, super rich, I could just buy loads and loads of Bitcoin. And I'd do Mr. Pinkle loss. Uh, but I don't mind anything, so I have no voting rights in that sense. So it's a really interesting problem. Whereas the, the miners, that, that, that tends to be dominated by organizations like right? mining courts. You're all kind of, I'm staring at you because you seem to know what we're talking about in the queue, right? You, you seem to no, no, I don't. I, 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 I don't know what I'm talking You had those eyes of knowing, either saying I was talking crap. <laughs> no, I, 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 think, I think that's a really interesting point. Right. And one that's totally, as far as I can see, unexplored is right. who makes the rules and who gets to to shape the conversation around the rules right. of cryptocurrency. And I think that there's a lot of, um, you, like you, can, you, can, you can understand why with Bitcoin, because there's a bunch of people who desperately want to escape the state, yeah. as far as I can see. And yeah, you can yeah, understand yeah. why they're, therefore they don't instantly turn around and have a conversation about how to elect government. Yeah. But there is, there is a problem there, and it's a big limiting factor for scaling Bitcoin up. Like, I mean, yeah. Oh, said minutes ago that the next thing you need is you need, uh, you know, an Amazon or an organisation right. like that to say we'll get involved. Well, the European Banking Authority put out a an opinion, uh, which is not binding, back in February, in which they said, well, here are a list of risks that we can see with financial institutions becoming yeah. involved in Bitcoin. Right up at the top of that list was we have no idea who Satoshi Nakamoto is. Yeah. And we have no idea who's running the shop. Yeah. And what they have said is, they have said, we, we, we are telling national regulators within the Eurozone to discourage regulated entities in their financial system involved. from getting involved in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, if, 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 you, if you want to bring the experiment another step out of the lab, you have to start resolving the government's questions. Yeah. And you have to start making that process and much more transparent. The foundation's just imploded yeah. you know, three weeks ago. If I was to okay. say, sorry, just a quick one. If I was going to invest money in Bitcoin, I don't think I should invest in buying Bitcoin, I should invest in mining. In mining. And how, so that right. I could get a lot of How would you do that? Do you know how you would do that? If, if I gave you £100,000 now and said go mine Bitcoin, what would you do? Good you know? question. <laughs> you, wouldn't go, you wouldn't buy a computer. Uh, you would buy, you would rent space on yeah. a on a rig, on a, on a mining pool that probably is in Iceland because that's where the energy costs are quite low. So you and, and you would pay for your space using your Visa card, which I think is right. Yeah, or, or yeah, or you just kind of raid someone's wallet. I don't know if you've seen. Um, this is in the Ethereum white paper, and I know you're you're quite right. proud of it. But they have they had a section on um, how to avoid kind of centralization or mining centralization right. with a couple of suggestions. I just wondered if you'd come across that or have any thoughts on it. Um. They were to be like that they were they were looking at they're looking at okay so Bitcoin have these centralizing tendencies. Is there yeah. any way that we can try and avoid this in the future? And one was I can't even remember some of them had to do obviously technically with the national algorithm. One was just in terms of, of um, they were they were trying to avoid basically any advantage yeah. for, um, in terms of, of yeah. to, to avoid basically mining rigs so that your computer should be able to mine as well. Yeah, I think there were loads. I mean, there, a lot of the outcoins that were developed, like Litecoin, all well, these things were, were, were designed, for, you know, Bitcoin's just basically not very well put together in the end. It's a genius idea, but it doesn't actually work all that well. It's, you know, it's energy consumption. You know, it's, it's, it's 72 litres of fuel sure. or something. Unbelievable. Um, but yeah, there are all sorts of alternatives that have been developed now. I was saying, I think again to Tim, a year ago, uh, of all the altcoins, Bitcoin was about 60%. So there was a, quite a large field of about 72 other altcoins that were, had some amount of space. I read today um, that that figure is now something like, nine, Bitcoin has 90%. So the, the altcoins have, have, have lost. So like the Dogecoin and all these things you know, that, were, that were there to compete don't seem to have been very successful. So Bitcoin does seem to be, to be kind of 
taking over, unfortunately, which is kind of worrying. But I, I agree that a, a lot of the, the, what, what you're saying is just a technological solution. I mean, you just you just do the software better, and that's what Ethereum was about. Maybe I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I need to agree with that because that's kind of a, like you say, technological solution. I mean, equally, the, well, equally the blockchain, you know, ten minute blockchain is a massive problem in the payments industry. The payments industry won't touch Bitcoin because it's too slow. You know, it's like 10 minutes, what's that? Now, I'm used to checks clearing in three days, but for them, 10 minutes is just hopeless. You know, they want 10 seconds. But Vitalik, the Ethereum guy, is, you know, he said, if you could do it in seven seconds, you could have a seven second blockchain, it's possible to do this really, really fast. Uh, so there are all sorts of alternatives, but in the end, whether the alternatives come through or not doesn't depend on technology, it depends on the politics around exactly, technology, yeah. and that's what's missing. Uh, and uh, you know, Bitcoin is backed so at the moment by eight hundred million dollars of venture capital. That's not going to go away. You know, that's, that's, Bitcoin isn't just going to disappear. Uh, and when Vitalik says he's got thirty percent of his own wealth tied up in Bitcoin, you know, the, the, the guy that's claiming that he's got the biggest rival, he's still. To, and when he said that in the room, it was like, what? You know, you went to say he's telling us that Bitcoin's no good, and you're still tied up in it to, to, to that degree. So it's going to be interesting, but but I, I think that there could be a much more uh, decentralised and much more distributed version of Bitcoin. It's just whether it's going to uh, going to happen, whether the politics are right. Can I just there was uh, a question here for a while. Do you have something else? Yeah, Sorry, they, they just to explore the government. Yeah, like we all say that we don't understand how it's done. Right. And we don't, like, and there were examples of those platforms which are supposed to empower commons, like the examples yeah, yeah. given of Uber or Airbnb, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, a yeah. good idea of people making transactions yeah. with, with each other, but like on the top there is hierarchy, which is, uh, which is right. not very transparent. And, uh, I, what do you think of the, like Vitalik's idea of Ethereum being governed by decentralized autonomous organization, organization which right. is DAO? I don't know whether you're familiar with this and how it can be maybe there could be a solution for this kind of decentralized no, I, th I think it could be that the problem then is, is um, with Ether Ethereum of God is who wants that. I mean, who's going to use, F I mean, what, what applications does Ethereum have? And how many of those applications are corporations and governments and whoever else going to be happy to get involved with, with a publicly transparent ledger, which is you know, owned by all of its, you know, most corporations aren't going to touch that. They're, they're just not, you know, they're, saying, oh, they're not putting that. Most banks aren't going to put their clearing systems onto a profit ledger, uh, yet they want to use blockchain technology. So that's why Eris, uh, um, and, and I sound like I'm pushing Eris, I haven't got shares in it or anything, nothing to do with it, I just find it fascinating because they seem to be getting ahead of the game simply because they're, they're, they're hearing what corporations want. And, and uh, you know, corporations want the distributed technology in certain applications because they see where it would work well. It wouldn't work everywhere, but it would work in certain. Uh, but they don't want it public, necessarily. Some do. Some want the transparency. So I think Vitalik's idea is great intellectually, but in terms of real-world applications, you know, I'm yet, well, let's see what happens. But so far, what's happened? Nothing. That's the problem. It's great in theory. But it is... Yeah, but it will look like the same problem with all the open source, for example, we are like open source foundation where uh, we have yeah. C -Pan, for example. C -Pan is a data publishing platform. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. so, uh, yes, we will put a lot of like uh, resources here yes, to develop in it. And now there is like it's been used all around the world and we yeah. don't even know where it's used and there is very limited I am coming back, but it needs to be maintained going forward. And yeah. the money part is missing out. The real right. foundation behind it, and uh, yeah, yeah, we try to raise money, but it's not. It's the same problem with, with like Wikipedia, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Which is uh, like everybody can contribute, but Wikipedia needs to own servers, it needs to pay for electricity, yeah. it needs to be. 
and it has to compete in the same space where Google, Twitter, and Facebook right. have much more. Yeah. I mean, Wiki means so there's obviously a really dozen. I mean, you just like as long as you've got computers, you know, that's that's it. That's yeah. your server. I mean, MadeSave is an interesting example of. Uh, MadeSave is a Scottish group, and they want to run something like Dropbox. You know, Dropbox. But instead of all, and I use Dropbox, and I actually I'm tempted to use MadeSave. But the idea of MadeSave is it runs a little bit like BitTorrent. So basically, you upload to the whole network, and you so your documents are up there, up on, but on this distributed cloud, and there isn't just one server that's. And they, I think they were issuing coins. Um, but I've never yeah, they're great. They're, 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 they're quite cool, I think, and that's a nice idea. So there are lots of kind of interesting, but I think it's going to be case specific. I can imagine cases where a fully distributed network, which is totally decentralized, would work really, really well and be fantastic. And I could, and, and, but there are lots of cases where it would just be idiotic. And certainly no bank, you can ask him, but no bank is going to touch anything that involves and utter decentralization. Yeah, if you look at the, the size of the Bitcoin community, you know, there are attempts to try and figure out the shape and size of it. We know it's, it's a very strong and vibrant community of people that are bringing it forward. It's not the entire world. It's, it's finite in size at the moment. And we're talking about the success of it. We're not necessarily saying it has to take over the entire world to be successful as a, as a technology platform or, or as a currency. Um, this technology, <coughs> It, talk about banking, banking organizations, they, their networks are vast. Possibly, you know, a bank, a bank could put in place one of these platforms, of, uh, you know, as big as the, one of the currencies that exist as it stands today. So it's worthwhile exploring that in a, in, in a closed system, uh, in, in vast sizes. Um, it puts the technology to just as good a use and just as, success, as successful a use as, as the communities are seeing. Can I just ask one quick related question? Uh, why is it so slow? Like, why is it there this 10 minute time lag? Is that just a, a matter that, you know, they're not Barclays and they haven't spent 40 years building a computer system that does things much quicker? Or is there something fundamental about how the technical side of Bitcoin works that makes it so <coughs> I think. It's, it's a technical, technological problem. You're, you're relying on other people to uh, confirm a transaction for you. Okay. That's part of the problem. Now, if you create a, a, a transaction on the Bitcoin network that has no fees, you will wait. So it's prioritized to prioritize the work. If you pay fees, do it. Help me out where you're um, your basically, head. if you had all the transactions going through, the blockchain couldn't handle it. So what it does is it actually establishes blocks and it updates the entire blockchain in the 10 minutes. Yeah. So that's what works. Well, the, the 10 minutes isn't, the, isn't an approval time for a transaction, it's the time for the next block to be generated. So a transaction yeah. can take multiple for that to be approved. Yeah. So and, and and that's because two, two things happen in that, in that 10 minutes. One thing is everything's recorded. And this is where a lot of confusion about Bitcoin arises. It does two things. And what the likes of Eris and Ethereum have done is to decouple these two things. In 10 minutes, it generates 25 bitcoins, which go to whichever node on the network has solved a particular computational problem, which increases in complexity the more nodes there are on the network. And second, it records everything across the network that's happened in that 10 minutes. And the idea behind Ethereum and Eris was, hang on, we don't need to generate 25 coins. We can just do the recording. We can turn this into a gigantic database, a memory machine, by having you know, an Excel spreadsheet shared by everybody. And that's that's what most people that are involved in this say that's where the real innovation is. The 25 coins are neither here nor there. It's the, it's the recording of, of all the uh, history of transactions that's, that, that matters. That's the argument that I'm hearing. But there are two separate things going on there. And what generates, what takes a lot of the heat is, is, is the coin generation, is the processing. I have no idea how that works in sociology. Just know it's complex. Do you? Anybody do you? Yeah, there's a great book. It, it's um, so it's from like that early draft. Right. Um, 
begin with Bitcoin, uh, right. Bitcoin or something, okay. and it, it's done at the Python code level. So. Is it possible then, if, if you know enough, is it possible to code, to, to pick up Rachel's question, to have an alternative protocol, an alternative code, which doesn't take so much energy to produce the coins in 10 minutes? You don't know. The 10 minutes of the design aim, it's not a technical limitation, it's actually a, it's actually a, an explicit design aim. Yeah. Well, it's. I think it's a matter of competition because if it didn't take so much energy, if it didn't take so much computer power, then you would have the risk of someone with a, a, a large computer being able to take over the whole network. Yeah, that's so it's. That's exactly what's happened. Yeah, yeah. Effectively, well, you have these. I mean, you have three big pools who control the mining. But then the argument is that even when they do that. Because it's so expensive, they are they're better off. The argument is that they are better off not rigging the system, but just completing these. Um, so even if they do mine most of the money, they have an incentive to do it in a proper way, so to speak. So their incentive to keep it as it is, because that's where they Because if they, if they improve it, make it easier to do, then potentially their are going Well, I, I think it's more a matter of their incentive. So if you, if you have a, a computer that's large enough to take over the whole system, then you can say, well, then you could use it to make up new transactions. Say, oh, yeah. you transferred all your money to me. Ah, great for me. But then the argument is that the way that this incentive structure is set up, they are better off just because they get this reward, they're better off just serving the system uh, and not and playing by the rules, so to speak. They, they that's that's been, the argument behind it. I agree, I agree that the resource problem is there. It is a huge problem. They, they've been self-regulating at this point. You've had situations where mining pools, or two or three mining pools have actually cut, crept up to 51%, yeah. and they've backed mm -hmm. off, and they've actually let people go to actually go back so that they were less in a sort of very anti-capitalist way. Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know why, but it's, I don't have a fancy computer science question, but isn't it just a market thing that we should expect people to be willing to spend 219 euro to mine a Bitcoin which is worth 220 euro? <coughs> so the amount of energy that will be used to mine a Bitcoin, maybe the amount of energy that you can buy in the form of computer thingies for 219 euro, which I guess that's 74, 74 liters energy in the form of computer power cost That's Marx's tendency for the falling rate of uh, profit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's absolutely right. I mean, that, you know, that's what you, you invest if, you, if you're a miner, which is Marx's game. If you're, a, if you're a miner, that's, that's your calculation. It's what the Bitcoin is worth at the end of the day, how much resource you're putting into it. So at the moment, you could say that Bitcoin is kind of like a digital fracking. <laughs> <laughs> well, the market's got out of fracking. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the crucial thing here is all the idea that of the, the genuinely distributed network where anybody has a chance of making coins. That was the ideal behind Bitcoin in the first place. It's important not to lose sight of that, and that's not happened. You know, you end up with an organized structure of mining pools, and it's not satisfying, and it's not elegant. And it's, and, and it's not what was intended. I think it's time we continue the conversation uh, with a drink here on campus. Uh, thank you very much for.